put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Today we're going to talk about clean and unclean. This is an issue that produces much controversy. Many, many believe that clean and unclean does not apply to our time anymore because according to some philosophies, Jesus declared all things clean. So we are no longer under these prohibitions. Some believe that this is only a purely Jewish concept. So we have to go to the Bible to find out where this issue comes from. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, And of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female, of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth. So the issue of clean and unclean is not a Jewish issue at all. In fact, this already existed before the flood. And before the flood, there were already clean animals and unclean animals. Now, if God created everything perfect, and he says, it was good, it was very good, then why do we have clean and unclean animals? Did something perhaps change? Did circumstances change on the planet? Now, I'm going to look at this from a scientific perspective. I know that there are ideological reasons for considering these things thus, Let's have a look at it from the aspect of science. It's interesting that Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar, Genesis 8.20. Now what were the criteria that determined whether a creature was clean or whether it was unclean? And if some say it was only a Jewish issue, then why do we have it here in the times of Noah already with a very clear distinction between what was clean and what was unclean? Obviously he knew and only later was it recorded by the authors of the book of Leviticus. Now we don't find clean and unclean laws only in Jewish culture. Islamic law forbids the eating of pork and the methods of slaughter that are used in Islam are very similar to those that are used by the Jews. In many societies, the eating of pork was prohibited. The Navajos and the Yakuts of northern Turkey, as well as the Laplanders, had prohibitions on the eating of pork. Now that's just one animal. What about all the other issues? Well, it's fascinating that the Iranians were not allowed to eat fish that did not have both fins and scales. Now where did that come from? This surely is something that goes back even further. Also, the inhabitants of the South Pacific will not eat eel, which is also an animal that falls into the category of the unclean. So there are very interesting uh, events here. Similar laws to the Levitical Code existed amongst the ancient Hindus and the Code of Manu. Manu was the Hindu equivalent of Noah forbade the eating of all carnivorous birds and all animals that did not have a cloven hoof. So here we have the same criteria in a totally different religious setup, and it goes back to the time of Noah. So it's not a Jewish law. Does it still apply today, or does it not? That is another issue that we will have to look at. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which you shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. So here is the complete description in the book of Leviticus as to what is unclean and what is clean, and what the difference is. Whatsoever parteth the hoof and is cloven-footed and cheweth the cud amongst the beasts that ye shall eat, nevertheless these shall you not eat of them that chew the cud. Now, scientifically speaking, chewing the cud is the regurgitation out of a pre-chamber in the stomach and re-chewing of the food before it is further digested. Now, it's fascinating that the animals that are listed over here that have the same sort of uh, physiology and anatomy, like the camel, for example, is unclean, for example. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat of them that chew the cud, and of them that divide the hoof, the camel. Because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is 
unclean to you. So certain animals have a similar anatomy, like those that have the cloven hooves, and yet they are still considered unclean. Some others that are mentioned, and the coney, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the hare, that's all the rabbit family, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean to you. Another scientific fraternity, which regards chewing of the cud something that is uh, depicted in ungulates, will say, well, the rabbit doesn't chew the cud. Yes, he does. He just chews it at a later stage, as we will see in a moment. So the biblical concept is a little bit broader. The animals are chewing that which they have ingested before. So the coney, the rabbit, they are unclean. And the swine, though he divide the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud. He is unclean to you. Of their flesh shall you not eat, and their carcass shall you not touch. They are unclean to you. So here is a very distinct description. So let's have a look at some of these creatures. Leviticus 11, 1 to 8. Well, there's a modern cow, and this creature, of course, chews the cud. Now, cows and ungulates in general have a pre-stomach, which is called the rumen, and there a fermentation process takes place. Sheep and goats fall into that same category. So if we go through the animals of the world that are considered clean, that fall into the clean category, we will have all the various wild and domestic goats in the world. We will have the ungulates of the fields, like the oryx, will be a clean animal. And all the buck and deer and game that we find out there in the world will be considered clean. And of course, they went into the ark in pairs of sevens. All of these beautiful creatures, the kudus, these are all clean animals. Fascinating and beautiful. There's the bongo with its stripes. Now, this is their anatomy. They have this pre-stomach, which is called the rumen. And if you look at the anatomy, you find the rumen, which is a large fermentation chamber. So the food that they chew largely vegetation, enters into the rumen. Their bacteria ferment this product. And in ruminants with a cloven hoof, this food is regurgitated, goes back into the mouth, is chewed over and over and over, and goes back into the rumen. And then it passes through various chambers, like the omasum, the abomasum, and eventually comes to the true stomach the abomasum, where it is digested. And this fermented food passes all the way through the intestine and uh, the rest is then defecated. Now what is fascinating is that this process is a continuum and the bacteria add certain nutrients which are not available in the plant material. For example, they will add certain varieties of amino acids which they produce and the bacteria themselves are digested in the process as they pass through the intestine so they add the nutrients which might be scarce in the environment. So the animal gets a complete nutrition as a result of this rumination process. Bacteria of course uh, produce many many substances which we find are often absent in nature. So let's have a look at this creature over here. Nevertheless, these shall you not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that have the divided hoof, that is the camel. Because he cheweth the cud, he has the same type of anatomy, he doesn't have the same foot anatomy, and the Bible says he is unclean. Now this is very strange. He has the same mechanism of eating, the same anatomy as far as that is concerned. Why is it considered unclean? Well. It's interesting that these creatures, you know, the beautiful picture of a camel, have been adapted to a desert environment. So something has changed in the environment which might affect the physiology of this creature. It is beautifully adapted to the desert environment, but one of the things that it can do is it can tolerate heat by just not sweating. And that means that the body temperature starts increasing 
but they don't lose water like other animals, so it can survive in the desert. But this also means that any toxins that are produced, like urea, etc., will accumulate in the tissues. And the, co the consequence is that the animal is not as fit for consumption as one that gets rid of all the toxic substances over time. So maybe that is one of the reasons why this creature is considered unclean. The coney, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean to you, and the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. Now why are these creatures unclean? They're also plant eaters, so in other words, they are very close to what the original diet on the planet was, and yet, when they have paws, these creatures, they tend to do something very interesting. They tend to practice coprophagy. Coprophagy, phagy means feeding. They ingest their own excreta. That's one of the reasons why these creatures might be considered unclean. So it's also a form of chewing the cud, but of course, instead of taking it from a pre-stomach, the rumen, and regurgitating it to the mouth, they're taking it from the other side. And uh, that makes a big difference. When the food passes through the intestine, then waste products are left, together with digestible products at the end, and when recirculated, some of these chemicals, like secondary bile salts and all of these issues which are detrimental, are added to the food chain. So a rabbit, for example, rather than having a pre-stomach, like uh, a cow, has the fermentation taking place in the cecum, which is at the end of the intestine. So now there's only one possibility. You can't put the entire intestine into reverse, so the product has to pass out of the intestine, and the rabbit produces two kinds of feces. One is the pellet form, and the other one is a soft form, which it eats directly from the anus, and thereby the bacteria and the fermentation products, which make the meal complete, are re-ingested. But because it passes right through the intestine, you have some of the secondary products, which are harmful, also passing through the intestine. And this animal, therefore, has a higher toxic load than would a ruminant under normal circumstances. So we see the cecum here in this dissected creature is very, very large and lies there as a big fermentation chamber. If you unravel the intestine of a rabbit, for example, you have this normal intestine where the absorption takes place over here, and then you have the large cecum where the fermentation takes place. So the only possibility to re-ingest that is to take it from the other side. These animals are considered unclean. Now the horse also doesn't have a cloven hoof, it's considered unclean, and it qualifies for the same criteria as the rabbit and the hare, because it also has the cecum at the end of the intestine. And horses tend to coprophag in the natural environment as well. It's strange, if you give them all the food that they need and give them high quality feed with all the variants, there is less coprophagy than otherwise. So here we can see the anatomy of the intestine of the horse, and we have exactly the same criterion. We have the cecum at the end of the intestine, as you have it in the case of the rabbit. So this creature is unclean. Now the pig is considered unclean in many, many societies. And uh, there's probably a good reason why this creature is unclean. If we go through the list of the creatures that are listed as clean in the Bible, we will see that they are all herbivores. All of them are herbivores. They, in other words, feed at the lowest level of the trophic aspects of the ecosystem. What's also fascinating is although some of them are herbivores, some of them are unclean. And that is when the anatomy is as we described in the case of the hare and otherwise, where they have to change their habits in order to gain enough nutrition out of what they eat. Now the pig is omnivore. It eats anything. It will scavenge, it will eat plant material, it will eat animal material. 
and we know that there is a process called biological magnification. The further you go away from the lowest feeding levels, the plant base, the more toxin is added to the tissues. So on the basis of that alone, this creature would qualify as unclean. A pig, of course, is also known for many other uh, diseases, parasitic and otherwise. Much of the parasite problem can be solved with the right medication. But there are other problems associated with pigs. Here is a, a, a snippet from one of the scientific magazines off the menu from early warnings that chickens were laying fewer eggs. The dioxin scandal grew to engulf Belgium's meat industry with a full ban on all poultry, beef and pork products. Here you have this question of biological accumulation of toxins and the pig, of course, is one that qualifies in this regard. Then you have some strange diseases, viral diseases, which tend to be very prevalent in pigs. Now it's interesting that in the past the pig was one of the nurturing chambers for viral change so that a species barrier could be crossed from animals to man. And the pig was always considered as one of these viral chambers where these changes could take place. Burying the bacon encephalitis diseases passing from the pig directly to the human. There are many, many reasons why pig should be considered unclean, scientifically speaking. Did human error spread a virus from pigs? Japanese encephalitis, a deadly disease, is spreading amongst farmers. So viruses jumping the species barrier often take a transitional phase in the pig. Pig transplants should be banned from hospitals. They use hot valves, etc. in the pigs. So again, the viral issue is of great importance. So God says, you know, leave these creatures alone and you will have fewer problems. Skin and joint disorders, boils, hives, psoriasis, gout, many of these issues are often associated with the eating of many or high quantities of these creatures. And whatsoever goes upon his paws amongst all manner of beasts that go on all fours, those are unclean unto you. Whoever touches as their carcasses shall be unclean until the evening, and that beareth the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. They are unclean unto you. Leviticus 24, 28. So creatures that walked on all paws were unclean. Now some people say, well, you know, what about my dog and my cat? They go on all fours. Yes, but you're not going to eat them, are you? You're just going to love them and cuddle them. The Bible doesn't forbid you loving and cuddling your horse or riding on an unclean animal. Even the Lord Jesus rode on an unclean animal. It says you mustn't eat them. So why are these creatures with paws unclean? Well, as we saw previously, they also are coprophagues. In other words, they tend to eat their own excreta, and so a dog will do exactly that, as many people with dogs will know. These also are unclean unto you among the creeping things that creep upon the earth, the weasel, the mouse, the tortoise after its kind, the ferret, the chameleon, the lizard, the snail, the mole. These are unclean to you among all that creep. Whosoever does touch them when they be dead shall be unclean until evening. Now there was a, a ritual law, but nevertheless all of these creatures fall into those same categories. They are mostly not herbivores, and if they are herbivores, then they are coprophags. So again, they would suffer from high, higher levels of toxins than others. So all of these little creatures, cute and cuddly as they might be, are not fit, according to the Bible, for human consumption. And uh, if we look at the little chipmunks and squirrels of the world, well, these creatures are unclean. They also tend to practice coprophagy. What is interesting, as the ecology deteriorates, for example, many forests are suffering a decline, so these creatures are finding it hard to find the sustenance that they need for life. And many of them are actually turning to road kills and becoming scavengers, even eating animal products. So again, they fall into this category of biological magnification as we move from the lower levels 
of the plant world into the higher trophic levels of eating animal material. The elephant is very similar in its anatomy to the coney, so it falls into that category as well. Also the coney has a, a, a relatively poor thermoregulation which also affects the digestive system. So this creature would also be considered unclean as well as the hippopotami and all of these fascinating creatures. Now there's an interesting experiment that was made. They took some mussel extract and made an extract and put this onto seeds and determined how these seeds were affected by the mussel extract. And so they went through the list of the animals listed in the book of Leviticus and discovered that when unclean animals were used then the extract had an effect on the growth of these plants. So here we have the effect of a 2% mussel extract from various animals used as a growth medium for seed seedlings of Lupinus albus on root growth compared to seedlings grown in a standard growth medium. And the results are expressed as a phytotoxic index where 100% indicates no impairment of growth. So they planted these little legumes and then in a growth medium measured their normal growth and normal growth was 100%. They added the extract. If the extract impaired the growth, well then it was less than 100%. So the closer we get to 100%, the better the growth and the less the impairment. And they compared sheep and ox and goat and deer and all of these creatures which are considered clean animals and found some fascinating things. The sheep, for example, produced a phytotoxic index of 94%. So there's a slight reduction in the growth as opposed to 100. But it's a clean animal. The ox, the goat, the deer, the calf, all of them clean and the percentages are relatively high ending down there in the calf in 82%. As soon as they took an unclean animal, the dog for example, it dropped to 62%. So there was a phytotoxic effect. Plants, phytotoxic, poisonous, poisonous to the plants. The black bear, the white rat, the grizzly bear, the pig, all of them of course depicted as unclean in the Bible impaired the growth of the organism. This is fascinating stuff. The cat, the groundhog, the opossum, the silver fox, the hare, the guinea pig. As we go down the list we find that the phytotoxic index increases. So there are chemical products in these creatures which impair the development of the plant. Maybe that's one of the reasons why God says we should not eat those creatures because they could impair certain aspects of our own development. So all of these creatures like the lizards and all of these are unclean. Now most of these creatures are, well, when we talk about their thermoregulation, they are not homeothermic, they don't keep constant temperatures, so they are subject to the environment. If it's cold, they are cold. If it's warm, they are warm. So we talk about cold-blooded, warm-blooded creatures, poikilothermic, homeothermic, in the more scientific uh, terminology. And these creatures, when they are cold and have food in their stomach, will actually have fermentation and rotting processes taking place, and the toxins will accumulate. That's why snakes don't eat in the winter, winter because they can get such high toxic loads that they could actually die from it. So these creatures are all considered unclean for a good reason. And though they are beautiful and interesting to look at, we shouldn't eat them, so says the Bible. A chameleon, wonderful creature. Some are afraid of them, some love them. God is a lover of variety and has produced a great number of life forms for us to enjoy. But he says, watch out. Some of them are detrimental to your health. Don't make them your diet. The basilisk, 
which looks just like a little dragon. And I wonder whether some of the legends of dragons don't come from here. Snakes, as I have said, with their thermoregulatory problems, obviously one of the reasons why they are considered unclean. And then, of course, the higher toxic loads which they have being high up in the trophic levels. The same with frogs. These creatures are carnivores and therefore qualify as unclean animals. The dog and the cat, unclean. Again, they're carnivores, so they're removed from the original. And the little mouse, well, it has the same problem as the rabbit. It has this huge cecum in its intestine, so it is a coprophage eating its own excreta. As well as all these beautiful creatures with their paws, they are not fit for human consumption. Now, when we get back, we will look at some of the other criteria as to why fishes, etc., are unclean and some are clean. Well, why are some fish clean and some fish unclean? This is a very intriguing question. These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters, whatsoever has fins and scales. In the waters, in the seas, and in the rivers, them shall ye eat, and all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, of all that move in the waters and of any living thing which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination unto you. Now before we continue, let me make it quite plain that some of the species that are listed over here, we are not quite sure today exactly what was meant because some of the linguistic uh, nuances have changed and we do not know always precisely which animal is involved. But there is enough indication to give us the criteria nevertheless. So what's the difference between one that has fins and scales and one that does not have them? They shall be even an abomination unto you. You shall not eat of their flesh, but you shall have their carcasses in abomination. Whatsoever hath no fins nor scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination unto you. Pretty clear. And as I've shown, it's not only the Jews that have these prohibitions, but we find them in other regions of the world as well. Now, an animal like a fish, which has fins and scales, is very interesting because somewhere in its life cycle, it is largely herbivorous, even if it is in the younger or larval stages that it is herbivorous. A fish is an amazing creature. It has a very high ability to detoxify itself. And of course, being uh, situated in water, its thermal uh, regime remains relatively constant. And when the temperatures do change seasonally, they adapt enzymatically. It's a fascinating physiological story. Eels, lampreys, catfish, all of these don't have scales. Now, where do they fit into the food chain? They are largely scavengers, and they will eat virtually everything. So they fall into the category of biological accumulation. They accumulate more toxins than the others do, and therefore should be considered unclean. Sharks and rays would fall into the category of the unclean, and they're a fascinating group of animals. Now they live in marine environments, many of them, and when they live in the marine environment, they have a problem. They don't have the ability of the fish that have fins and scales to rid themselves of the salts which constantly move into the body as perfectly as the others do. So these creatures solve their osmotic water problems in a different fashion. A bony fish will excrete salts through the gills, so when it drinks seawater, it desalinates the seawater and gets fresh water through this process. And uh, that is how these fishes survive in a marine environment. A shark, on the other hand, also has less salt in its body than the sea has. So you would have the problem that water tends to leave the animal. It has a salt gland in the rectum whereby it can get rid of some of the salts but it solves its water problem by retaining urea. And so it has very high levels of urea. Urea is, of course, a waste product 
which other animals just excrete to get rid of it because it is toxic. But these creatures retain it and have developed a resilience and a resistance to this product. So in fact, they are like urea enhanced creatures. So what would happen if you took the fins of the top of the animal and dried them? Well, what you would get is you would get crystallized urea. And when you make shark fin soup, that's exactly what you have. It's like putting a urea tea bag in the soup. It surprises me that it's so expensive. So these creatures are considered unclean by the biblical criteria for a very good reason. When we look at the, the arthropods of the world, the little creepy crawlies of the world, many of them, of course, are scavengers. And they are, well, if, as, as it were, the, the kidneys and the livers of the environment cleaning up the dirt. As such, they are subject to much higher levels of toxins than other animals. And when you have flares of, of let's say, red tides or something similar in the environment, then all of these creatures become extremely dangerous for human consumption because they will accumulate more of these toxins in their systems than any of the other creatures. So they are toxin accumulators. The Bible says they are unclean. So physiologically speaking, there's a good reason as to why the calamaris of this world, the squids and all of these creatures should be considered unclean. When we go back to our phytotoxic index of the various fish, you find something fascinating. The sea bass, the herring, the pike, the salmon, the cod, all of those fare relatively well. The tuna, the halibut, the white perch, the rainbow trout. As soon as you come to the shark, boom, there's a drop from the 80s to the 60s. It's as if there is a transition. The porcupine fish, the puffers, the moonfish, the catfish, the eel, and you can see the phytotoxic index. Uh, showing that these tissues are detrimental to the growth of the plants. So all the slimy, creepy crawlies out there should be considered hazardous. Here's another interesting feature. Many of their neurotransmitters and nerve transmitters are somewhat different to ours, and many people have tremendous allergic reactions to some of these. In actual fact, it's probably safe to say that all people are actually allergic. Some just show it more than others. When it comes to the fowls of the air, and these are they which you shall have an abomination amongst the fowls, you shall not be eaten, they are an abomination, and then it talks about the eagle, the ossifrage, the osprey, the vulture, the kite, the raven, the hawk, the owl, etc., etc., et et the hawk, the cormorant, the swan, the pelican, the herring, the lapwing, the bat. Now, all of these, again, are what? They're either carnivores or they're scavengers. So again, they do not qualify. The Bible says that in the beginning, all animals ate plant material. So the fall induced a change in the diet, and that in turn produced unclean animals. So God didn't produce them unclean, create them unclean in the beginning because they were never intended to be eaten in the first place. The human diet, according to the Bible, was plant-based, if we read what it says in the book of Genesis. So today, we have clean birds, which we have in our dietary regime. The question is, if the criteria are so precise there in the Bible, and any animal that deviates from the original far enough becomes unclean, then what if you feed these animals what they do not naturally get in their diet? What if you make these animals carnivores like the industry often does, but feeding them carcass meal and fish meal and all of these issues, some of which is now being banned universally or in some countries and in others not. So does an animal remain clean by definition or do we look at the criteria and say, well, maybe these creatures are no longer what they used to be. Maybe they're not clean anymore. 
So quails were, of course, clean animals, and pigeons were considered clean animals. These have a crop, and very similar to the ruminant, will have a fermentation in the beginning of the intestine. And uh, the ostriches, that's one of the difficult ones to classify in terms of the, the nomenclature of what it's, what it's called in the Bible. And these creatures, some of them with, with webbed feet, the German Bible has an interesting translation. It says, die ganz und seine Art, which means the goose and its kind, uh, sort of demonstrating that anything with webbed feet might be considered unclean. This is a difficult area to determine, but the criteria still applies. If it's removed from its original dietary source and eats something else, then it should be considered unclean. So the pelican and all these fish-eating birds should be considered unclean. Penguins and the like. And of course, some of these interesting creatures eat many, many materials which are not plant-based, like the pelicans and uh, these beautiful creatures over here. And the owls, of course, and the birds of prey are well known for their carnivory. Isn't it interesting? The further removed from the original, the uglier they get. So if you look at a vulture, which has become a scavenger, is even further down in the trophic levels, then they become pretty ugly. Here is the American uh, condor, the Andean condor. Beautiful, magnificent creatures. And uh, then you have the scavengers, ugly and pretty ugly. There are still reminders of the beauty of Eden somewhere over there, but uh, surely this is not good, very good. So let's have a look at the phytotoxic index of these birds. The pigeon in the 90s, the duck, the quail, the coot, the swan, the goose, the turkey, and as we go down the list we come suddenly to the sparrow hawk, and what do we find? The sudden drop into the 60s as we come to these carnivorous birds that are clearly depicted as unclean. The owl, the crow, the hawk, they are unclean animals. Now, all fowls that creep going upon all fours shall be an abomination unto you. You know, I've had a lot of altercations about this verse because uh, some of my scientific uh, colleagues would say, you know, the Bible doesn't even know its anatomy. Because here the Bible talks about insects having four legs. No, 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 no. You have to read it carefully. It says here, all flying insects, New King James Version, that creep going upon all fours. Now, insects have six legs, that is right. But two of them, the front ones, are used more like hands than feet. So if you sit and watch a fly, you will see it washing its face and cleaning its eyes with its front feet. If you watch a praying mantis, two of them are up, it catches and holds its prey with the two front feet. So in actual fact, four of them are more like legs, feet, and two of them are more like hands. So let's be specific. The Bible is not that inaccurate after all. Yet these you may eat of every flying creeping thing that goes upon all four, which have jointed legs above their feet to leap with all upon the earth. Even these of them you may eat the locust of its kind, and then it mentions a few, and here it becomes vague or difficult to say whether we have the exact right translation or not. So when it comes to beetles and crickets after its kind, well, some say cricket, some translations, some don't. Personally, I would say the cricket wouldn't qualify because it will also eat some other creatures after his kind and the grasshopper after his kind. But all other flying, creeping things which have four feet shall be an abomination unto you. So grasshoppers, which are strict herbivores, they are clean. So there is no prohibition on the eating of this creature. But when it comes to certain beetles, well, they're dung beetles, surely they qualify as the same category as the, as the coprophagues, so they would be considered unclean. And uh, creatures like the praying mantis or 
dragonflies which are carnivorous are unclean. So the Bible again is very accurate. What is far removed from the original becomes unclean. And upon whatsoever any of them, when they are dead, doth fall, it shall be unclean, whether it be any vessel of wood or raiment or skin or sack, whatsoever vessel it be, wherein any work is done, it must be put into water, and it shall be unclean until the evening, so it shall be cleansed. And every earthen vessel, wherein to any of them falleth whatsoever is in it, shall be unclean, and you shall break it. Fascinating, Leviticus 11, 32 to 36. So if something unclean falls into a container which you are using for your own foods, it's unclean. Now consider this. As it deteriorates in there, it's dead, so the chemicals inside it leach into the waters or into whatever is in that vessel. Now, if the plants have a detrimental effect to a muscle extract, then maybe these components which serve as gene activators or might be carcinogenic are not fit for human consumption. So this is a very interesting criteria. If development can be impaired in a plant, why not in a human? So don't eat them. Of all the wheat meat which may be eaten, that on which such water cometh shall be unclean, and all drink that may be drunk in every such vessel shall be unclean, and everything whereupon any part of their carcasses fall shall be unclean, whether it be an oven or ranges of pots, they shall be broken down. Now some of these pots were earthen, earthenware, and some of the ovens were clay ovens. Now when these materials end up in them, they end up in the pores of these pots and these ovens. So the Bible says, break them, get rid of them. So if you have a stainless steel one, that would be different. But an oven of clay... The compounds, every time that oven, oven heats up, would again be released into the environment and could become part of your tissues and they could be carcinogenic or whatever. So scientifically, there seems to be a good reason as to why this is a good criterion. Get rid of it. So these are some of the ancient uh, clay ovens that they used in ancient times. And if any part of their carcasses fall upon any sowing seed, which is to be sown, it shall be clean by the any water be put upon the seed, and any part of their carcass fall thereon, it shall be unclean unto you. I found this very interesting. In other words, a seed can be impaired by the chemicals which come from the unclean animal. But if the animal is dry, there is no diffusion of this material into the seed, so the seed growth cannot be impaired. But if there's water, and then diffusion can take place and you would have exactly the criteria that you had in this plant growth experiment. The plant would be impaired. So don't use that seed. Fascinating. It makes perfect sense to me. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. It shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings that you eat neither fat nor blood. Leviticus 3 verse 17. Well, that's a pretty interesting criterion. Any scientist today who is worth his oats will tell you why fat is detrimental in terms of heart disease, in, in, in terms of carcinogenic effects or cancer promotion. Fat is the number one criterion. Blood, on the other hand, contains many of the nutrients that you have in the body, but it also contains the toxins that are to be removed from the body. So obviously, eating blood is not a good idea. I know many cultures do it, but biblically speaking, it's not a good idea. And scientifically speaking, it's not a good idea either. Moreover, you shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be of fowl, of beast, any of your dwellings whatsoever. Soul that eateth any manner of blood, even the soul shall be cut off from its people. Well, of course, there was a... There was a ritualistic reason for this as well, but purely scientifically, it's not a good to eat something that contains the products that have to be removed from the body. The prohibition did not only apply to the Old Testament, but also applied in the New Testament. And this is interesting because many ignore this prohibition. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Acts 15 verse 20. So here are some of the Levitical laws being repeated 
even in the New Testament. So, did we get rid of these criteria in the Christian era, or did we not? Not that which goes into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man, Matthew 15, 11. Does this statement imply that everything is now clean? Of course not. It's a spiritual application that watch what you speak about, watch what you say, because that is a window of what is happening in your soul. So, does clean and unclean still apply in terms of the biblical criteria today? Well, one of the texts that is used to say that clean and unclean is no longer what it was is the story of Acts chapter 10. Now, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian Band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Now, what we have here is the story of a non-Jew who found God. And the story goes that he had a vision and he sent his delegates to Peter, who was a Jew, and as such would re have regarded those of the other nations as unclean. And this story has a fascinating content. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming unto him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy alms are come up for the memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. Now Simon would never have gone with these men if God had not intervened in a marvelous fashion. So we read, On the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray upon the sixth hour, and he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. In other words, he had a vision, and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto men and had a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. So down comes the sheet, and in it was what? All manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things. Now what was that? Those were the unclean animals. And a voice came to him and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. So the instruction was, the criterion no longer applies, go and eat. Or was it? But Peter said, Not so, Lord. Because he knew what clean and unclean stood for. For I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spoke unto him a second time, What God has cleansed thou shalt not call common. So here he's thinking, now what does this mean? Now, if this was a lifting of the prohibition, Peter should immediately have gone to the local unclean butcher, if there was such a thing, and prepared himself something unclean to eat. But he didn't do that. He said, not so, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean in all my life. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. And while Peter doubted in himself what the vision which he had seen should mean, because Peter knows he's God and he knows there are not two sides to this issue. There must be some other reason. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry. They appeared, and Peter went with them. And while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, here are the three men. I have sent them. Go along with them. And off he goes. And he met these people, and they went with them to Cornelius. They said, Cornelius the centurion, an on Jew, had sent me, and he wants you to come. So off he went. And as Peter comes to this house, Cornelius falls down at his feet, and Peter says, No, 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 don't do that. Get up, I am only a man myself. And then he uses this interesting speech. You know how that it is unlawful for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into one of another nation. But God has showed me when, in that vision, that I should not call any man common or unclean. Acts 10, 25 to 28. So, the prohibition here had to do with people. The gospel was to go to the Gentiles. It had nothing to do with eating or drinking. Peter did not run to the nearest unclean butcher. Peter went to Cornelius and said, God showed me in vision I may not call any man impure or unclean. 
So the question I have today, the very logical criteria that we have in the Bible, are those still applicable today? That which was unclean then is still unclean today. And nowhere in the Bible do we find a lifting of this restriction. So if you want to follow God in terms of all of these criteria, you would do well to study what he has to say on the issue of clean and unclean. May God bless you. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Why do we have a seven-day week? Join us next time as we travel back to our biblical origins and find a very special day to remember.